Ariana Grande, Victoria Justice, Big Time Rush, Drake Bell, Miranda Cosgrove, The Naked Brothers Band. All successful Nickelodeon stars for sure. But besides Ariana, all of them had very minor success in their music careers. I mean, compared to Disney, who at the time were creating massive pop stars. We talked about Disney's highly calculated approach to making these actors superstars, but Nickelodeon fumbled huge opportunities. These two networks were peaking from 2000 to 2012. They had wildly successful TV shows and extremely talented acts. For 19 years straight, Nickelodeon had higher yearly viewership than the Disney Channel. They pursued a similar strategy when it came to casting talent and then releasing music with them. But they had minor billboard success, and none of them even had a platinum record. Besides Ariana Grande, who is the fourth most streamed artist in history, has over 70 platinum certifications and is on her way to becoming one of the top female artists of all time. And she wasn't even the star of the show on Nickelodeon. My name is Patrick CC. Today we're going to find out how Nickelodeon catastrophically missed on every one of their talents, but also somehow created the biggest talent of them all at the same time. Drink water while you're watching this video. This is definitely a picture of me in the mirror telling you that this video is sponsored by Manscaped. And oh boy, Christmas came early this year because I just got gifted the new performance package by Manscaped. They created the world's first all-in-one men's grooming kit that has you covered from head to toe. The Lawnmower 4.0 is a waterproof cordless trimmer built with advanced skin safe technology, which helps reduce nicks and cuts on your most sensitive areas. I can't recommend them enough, and do you think a guy as clean as me would mislead you? Plus, you'll also get two free gifts when you order. So don't wait. Go to manscaped.com and use my promo code PatrickCC to get 20% off plus free international shipping. Thanks, Manscaped. I feel like I should mention that Nickelodeon is not the sole reason why these artists are successful or unsuccessful. But for the most part, if it wasn't for their roles on these various shows and movies, we wouldn't be talking about them here today. In 1979, Nickelodeon aired its first show. In 1993, Nickelodeon Records was founded. They started the label to release music, soundtrack, and original works from the artists or characters on their shows. The network struggled to become profitable in the 80s. They were losing millions of dollars per year. One year, they were actually the lowest viewed network out of all the US cable channels. They were more concerned with getting viewership than selling music. After all, if nobody's watching the TV shows, then how could the music be successful? But in the early 90s came popular animated shows like Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy. Ren and Stimpy was the most popular cable TV show in 1992, which led to their first official Nickelodeon Records release, You Idiot by Ren and Stimpy. This was a 20-song album that acted as a soundtrack consisting of popular songs from the series. As you can imagine, this wasn't very successful of an album because who the f*** is going to listen to this? But for some reason, they released two more, and only five more soundtracks for the rest of the 90s. None of them really did anything. The first time we saw any sitcom or non-animated show related to music was in 2001 with a show called Taina. I didn't even know about this show. It aired for less than one year. But before doing research, I thought that Lizzie McGuire and the Cheetah Girls, both Disney Channel shows, were the first examples of either of these networks pursuing music with one of their stars. But it turns out that Nickelodeon actually started this trend. Taina was a show about a high school girl who wanted to become a pop star. She attends the Manhattan High School of Performing Arts, and every episode features Taina daydreaming of eventual superstardom and occasionally performing a new song, which is basically the same exact plot as Victorious. They even released an album to complement the show in February of 2001, which was six months before the first Lizzie McGuire soundtrack. So the perfect formula that I praised Disney for in my last video was actually started by Nickelodeon. The formula is very simple. Find a young talent, cast them for a show, throughout the episodes make it clear that this character is a musical artist, then release an album under their name and capitalize on the millions of people who watch the show and associate the character with the music. Taina walked so Lizzie, the Cheetah Girls, Miley, Selena, Demi, and all of them could run. Obviously, Taina as a show, as well as her album, were very unsuccessful, which is why they canceled it and didn't try again. But after Taina's short run, we had the Romeo show in 2003. Lil Romeo was the star of a sitcom that was basically about his real life as a kid rapper with a famous rap star as a father. Nickelodeon Records never did an official release with him most likely because he was already a famous rapper, even at the age of 12. In 2001, Romeo had a single titled My Baby reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100. His debut album went gold and had a run of Billboard charting singles for a couple of years. So Nickelodeon didn't scout him as a random kid and transform 
transform him into a star. They just made a show about somebody who was already famous. I actually think Nick hurt his music career because the most musical success he had was before season one of The Romeo Show. Luckily, this led to him having a 20-year acting career. I'm assuming Nick never did a music release with Romeo because of his father, Master P. Master P is known for being one of the first rappers to have independent success in the 90s and 2000s when it was borderline impossible to have a musical career without a major label. He's a mogul known for never giving up ownership of his music and remaining independent, so I'm sure Master P negotiated a really fruitful deal with Nickelodeon. Probably borderline line finesse them into making him and his family more famous. In 2004, Drake and Josh aired on Nickelodeon and became a huge hit. In the show, Drake Bell was essentially the cool guy ladies man who played the guitar and was the front man of his own band. Plus, he performed the intro song, which was another common practice for Nickelodeon and Disney to have the star actor perform the intro song. Nick Records released the soundtrack to the show in 2005 after season two. Probably a little too late. Shoulda did it after season one. It charted number 178 on the Billboard Hot 200, but only sold 1,200 copies first week. The only two songs that had minor success were obviously the intro song and Soul Man, which was performed by both of them in the show. Again, for some reason, Nick didn't pursue Drake as a musical artist. Maybe they thought he sucked. Because during the time he released an independent album called Telegraph and in 2006 signed with Motown Records to do his second album, It's Only Time. I feel like Nickelodeon missed out big time with Drake Bell. He was absolutely huge at this point. Every kid in America thought he was the coolest guy ever. He won three Kids Choice Awards for Favorite Actor, and why they didn't try to organize a record deal with him, I don't know. His only popular songs are the ones that he performed on the show. Isn't that an obvious sign? Give him a deal and have him perform the songs in the episodes. Exactly what Disney was doing. Drake didn't really end up the way we thought he would though, so I guess it doesn't matter. But Drake and Josh did lead us to Miranda Cosgrove with iCarly, which had a lot more success. But before we talk about iCarly, we have to talk about Nick's most successful music act at this point, the Naked Brothers Band, who have a really strange story. <laughs> the Naked Brothers Band started out as an independent film about Nat and Alex Wolf, real life brothers. Their father, Michael Wolf, was a professional musician, and their mother, Polly Draper, a successful actress. While recording their very first song, their mother came up with the idea to make a mock documentary about them as if they were a massively successful band. She intended on it being an independent family project. The film had many celebrities who were friends with the boys' parents, including, but not limited to, Cindy Lauper, Julianne Moore, Ann Curry, Uma Thurman, and Arsenio Hall. On October 23rd, 2005, Draper and Wolf entered the film at the Hamptons International Film Festival, where it won the Audience Award for Family Feature Film. The former president of Nickelodeon, Albie Heck, <laughs> happened to be at this film festival. He ended up bringing the film to Nickelodeon and suggested that it be adapted into a TV series. They started producing the show in January 2007. The Naked Brothers Band, The Movie, aired on Nickelodeon, followed by the first season of the series in the next month. The series would see three seasons, each being accompanied by a soundtrack album. The Naked Brothers Band first album in 2007 would debut at number 23 on the Billboard Hot 200. I Don't Wanna Go to School would also reach number 23 on the Billboard Hot 200, making the Naked Brothers Band the most successful talent that Nick Records has seen up until this point. iCarly premiered in September of 2007 to 4.1 million viewers. The hype was real. Miranda Cosgrove performed the intro to iCarly along with Drake Bell, but on the show she wasn't a musical artist. She was an internet star. She was kind of like the first YouTuber. After season one, Nick would release the iCarly soundtrack. It would include performances by Miranda Cosgrove, The Naked Brothers Band, Good Charlotte, Sean Kingston, Avril Lavigne, and more. It reached number 28 on the Billboard Hot 200 and number one on the Billboard Kid Albums charts, the most successful soundtrack yet. So they had back-to-back -back success with The Naked Brothers Band and now Miranda. So you think, okay, let's sign Miranda and do exactly what we just did with Nat and Alex. No. They didn't sign Miranda, so she went off and signed a record deal with Columbia. She released the album Sparks Fly, and that would peak at number 8 on the Billboard Hot 200, and she had a single from the album go on to be certified gold. Nick, how did you fumble that? Cosgrove would also release two EPs with Columbia, About You Now and High Maintenance, which would reach number 34 on the Billboard Hot 200. Now again, these numbers don't hold a candle at all to the numbers that Disney was doing, but still, Nick had an opportunity here to capitalize. They realized that they needed to buckle down and figure out this music shit, because Disney Channel couldn't stop making platinum records, and Nick flopped with Tyena, got finessed by Lil Romeo, totally ignored the potential of Drake Bell, and got their newest big star, Miranda Cosgrove, 
Cosgrove, stolen by Columbia Records. Which brings us to Big Time Rush. Nickelodeon signed BTR to Nick Records and named the show after their band name. Promptly after signing, Nickelodeon would partner with Columbia Records to produce the show and the accompanied music. All of their music would be released jointly under Nickelodeon and Columbia Records. Finally, Nickelodeon realized the opportunities that they were missing out on. So they partnered with the experts, Columbia Records, to actually give their talent a decent chance for success. And it paid off. Their debut single, Big Time Rush, would be released the same time as the first episode of the show in November of 2009. It also serves as the show's opening theme, so the band name, TV show, intro song, and the first single all had the same name. A little cringe and definitely try-hardish, but hey, they're doing something. Throughout season one of the show, promotional singles would be released as they were premiered in the coinciding episodes. All right, they're starting to figure it out. Just a few weeks after the show got going, the first album would debut at number three on the Billboard Hot 200 and number one on the soundtracks chart, selling 67,000 units in the first week. The song Big Night from the album would debut at number 79 on the Billboard Hot 100, making it their highest peaking song at the time. The album would go on to be certified gold. So things are working. Big Time Rush is on their way. At the end of the first season, they introduce Victorious. Victoria Justice is the main character of the show and the plot is about her life as a teenager attending the Hollywood Performing Arts Academy. Here's where she meets Ariana Grande and they become friends. In the show, they often have to perform theatrics and of course singing. They created the show literally because of Hannah Montana. The show debuted to 5.7 million viewers. It was an instant hit. Now with BTR and Victoria Justice, we start to see this overlap happen. They're working on two musical acts at the same time, starting to take some notes from Disney. November 2010, the first song accompanying the show Victorious was a single called Freak the Freak Out and would reach number 50 on the Billboard Hot 100. A few months later, February 2011, while the second season of Big Time Rush was being shown on Nick, the band would release their third single, Boyfriend, featuring Snoop Dogg. It would peak at number 72 on the Billboard Hot 100 and would go on to be certified gold, making it their biggest song at the time. So far, so good. These two are looking promising. Then in August of 2011, the first soundtrack for Victorious would be released. Debuted at number 5 on the Billboard Hot 200, 40,000 units sold in the first week. So they're getting organized. Focus on Big Time Rush, then go back to Victorious, then back to Big Time Rush. November 2011, BTR's second studio album, Elevate, would be released. Again, while the second season of the show was still being aired on Nick. It would debut at number 12 on the Billboard Hot 200, which is lower than the previous, but it would actually sell more copies in the first week with over 70,000. But one key thing Thing was happening during all of this. Ariana Grande. She was the co-star on the show Victorious, and her musical talents were being completely ignored. But I'll get to that in a minute. March of 2012, Big Time Movie would be released, and it would premiere on Nickelodeon to 13.1 million viewers. Four days before this, the Big Time Movie soundtrack would be released, consisting of six covers of some of the most famous Beatles songs. The soundtrack would peak at number 44 on the Billboard Hot 200. But in my opinion, this is a huge miss. Disney did a similar promo for the Jonas Brothers to 10 million viewers and got a gold album from it. I don't know what happened, but 13 million viewers and you have an album flop? I think Nickelodeon missed their big time. The second soundtrack, Victorious 2.0, more music from the hit TV show, would be released in June of 2012. The album would reach number 18 on the Billboard Hot 200, number one on Billboard Kid Albums, and number two on the Billboard Soundtrack Charts, which is great. Season three for Victorious and Big Time Rush are happening, but the end of these shows is near. And really the end of Nickelodeon and Disney Channel peak relevance is also near. The next soundtrack for Victorious and next album for Big Time Rush still did very well, but they were were the lowest performing projects for both of these acts. Nickelodeon was hyper-focused on making Big Time Rush and Victoria Justice superstars. They were always playing catch-up to the Disney Channel. From 2010 to the beginning of 2012, they had a Disney-like pop star factory working. A little bit. I mean, they weren't going platinum. But for Nick's standards, they were doing better than they had ever done. While they were focused on this, they let the biggest talent of them all slip right past them. Ariana Grande was a co-star of Victorious. She had very little involvement on the Victorious soundtracks despite being the obvious better performer. Her talents were kind of ignored, so much so that she went to posting her covers on YouTube. Covers of Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston, like songs that are borderline impossible to perform. The covers were so good and were getting so much traction that she got signed to Republic Records. So her day job was on Victorious, and Nick was so focused on their big acts, that Ariana got sidelined and swooped up by a major label. But it almost seemed inevitable that Victoria Justice and Big Time Rush would go on to have a very successful music career. But shortly after the show ended, BTR's high 
type was replaced by One Direction and they took a hiatus. After Victorious ended, Justice signed to Columbia and released a single called Gold. It was a commercial failure and she would depart from Columbia shortly after due to creative differences. So after both Nick's biggest acts flop and quit music, three months later Ariana released her debut album Yours Truly. It went number one on the Billboard Hot 100, sold 138,000 copies first week, and went platinum within the first year. Nickelodeon had to be looking at that like, they came out with a terrible attempt to recreate High School Musical with the show How to Rock that was canceled after one season. They attempted a Wizards of Waverly Place knockoff, but the relevance of both of these networks really died down after 2014. It had some minor success here and there, but social media, YouTube, Vine, and now TikTok are just absolutely dominating kids' attention. I don't know if they'll ever come back. Ariana Grande slipped by Nickelodeon and became one of the biggest artists today. You could argue she is the biggest musically out of both networks. She has the most followers on Instagram, is the fourth most streamed artist in the world, the most streamed female artist in the world, and has sold over 70 million records. I think the simple reason why Nick missed out and Disney didn't is just that their talent scouting wasn't as good. And they didn't do a great job marketing either. Because Nickelodeon had more average viewers than the Disney Channel for 19 years straight. They could have done better cross promo, talked about singles or albums in the show, run commercials, promote the music, premiering music videos on the network, just really taking that promo to the next level. Another reason why they weren't as successful was because they were always playing catch up to the Disney Channel. They were trying to recreate and redo what the Disney Channel was doing but a year or two later, after nobody really cared about it anymore. Instead of trying to build their own future, it was all about keeping up with the times. And while they were so busy trying to keep up with the times, their biggest stars just slipped right past them. Ultimately, Nickelodeon is 40 years younger than Disney, so they had a lot less time to figure this out. And I don't think they'll ever have another opportunity to create pop stars like this. I guess if we want good entertainment, all we have left is little old Patrick CC. Make sure you're subscribed.